Mans Health Forum's um, a, a peak body, and, and peak bodies are these weird things. It's like, what do they do? You know, they don't actually deliver any service. Um, they are, you know, often doing things behind the scenes at a policy level, at a strategic level. You know, the, the, the conversation I often dread at the barbecue, apart from why are you a vegetarian and why don't you drink beer? Because I have to deal with those two questions. Um, but <laughs> apart from those two questions, which makes me very popular at Aussie Barbies, is, um, is what do you do? You know, uh, and trying to explain to people, you say, our oh, men's health, and then people, when you think of men's health, people go, oh, prostate cancer, uh, uh, testicular cancer. More recently, people do think mental health and, 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 and male suicide. Um, but that's about the sum of it. Or then they'll get into a conversation of, oh, well, you know, men don't go to the doctors or talk about their health like women. We'll get into this kind of like stereotypical deficit conversation about men not going to the doctors uh, and that's pretty much people's understanding of, of 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 men's health so the australian men's health forum uh has been around for at least 25 years it's kind of brought together the men's health movement um definitely trace our history back to the first national men's health gathering in melbourne in 1995 um have over the years been mostly voluntary so essentially been a representative body of different organizations working in men's health what's men's health so um, not just going to the doctors and going to see a psych not just you know heart disease prostate cancer not just smoking drinking weight exercise nutrition all important stuff but basically our health is shaped by our lives you know um, what in technical terms is called the social determinants of health. I talk to people and say, do you know boys' education is a men's health issue? And the reason boys' education is a men's health issue is because the better your education, generally speaking, the better your health. The longer you stay in education, generally speaking, the longer you live. And so when we systemically, consistently fail to get good results for boys when compared to girls, we're setting those boys up at the age of 5, 11, 18 to have unhealthier lives in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years time. So if we improve the way we educate boys today, we improve men's health tomorrow. So a, a, a quick question then regarding that uh, you said, you know, that you're really trying to tackle these social factors and educational factors that go way back into childhood. Uh, for uh, for men, you know, to, when they when they're young boys, is there? Uh, do you does that mean that you are working more uh, with the educational um, arena as well? Not as much as we'd like. Hmm. Not as much as we'd like. So, I mean, to, to map out all the areas, it's like education, fatherhood, our experiences of boyhood, male role models, rites of passage. Uh, working lives, social connections, something that the mentoring men community does so well. I, I, I love a, a little fact I told for you. Um, being lonely and social, socially isolated is worse for your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So, uh, and, and I sometimes make the joke in a workplace when I give, I give a talk like this that, you know, when you go outside on the lunch break and you see the one bloke sitting on his own eating a carrot stick and the five blokes having a smoko and chatting, the guys having a smoker might be healthier because they've got the social connection. Now, ideally, you shouldn't smoke and you should have social connection as well. But the point is that, you know, health isn't just about being pure and moral and doing all the right things. It's, it's about relationships and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so um, the org we bring together individuals and organizations that are working to improve the lives and health of men and boys. That's how we define it. And so that's why mentoring men and Ian and, and possibly other people on this call are, are part of our community. They're not doctors. Uh, they're not nutritionists. Um, they're not you know, exercise physiologists. But you guys are doing men's health. You guys are doing men's health by creating, by, by virtue simply of providing social connection for each other. That's men's health. Yeah. Uh, and then everything else on top of that, those other things are, 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 are a bonus. So. 
Yeah. Okay. Good. Now that's fantastic. Now you've you've been in this area for some time, and um, it, it appears that there are hundreds, if not thousands, now of groups around Australia that are that have a focus on men's health of some kind. Have you seen that growth in recent times? Is it, uh, how has that evolved? Or, or, or do you, is there an estimate of how many um, groups there are supporting men's health in the country? Yeah, it's, it's, it's massive uh, and it is very recent. Uh, but, you know, um, we were talking about this at the, um, at the at Men's Health Connected event we had in, in June. Um, and can I just say thank you for COVID-19 COVID for that opportunity, because, you know, um, not to make light of an awful disease, which is wreaking havoc on so many people's lives. But we were supposed to be running our 25th anniversary men's health gathering in Melbourne in May. And for obvious reasons, we couldn't do it. Um, and we ended up doing something which was above and beyond that, which wouldn't have been possible three or four months ago, which was bringing, bringing people to work together in the online space and that just provided such a massive opportunity which wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for COVID-19 um, and part of that was actually lots of grassroots organizations who are people just getting off the right off the backside and they're not you know not necessarily funded by government not necessarily coming out of a particular uh, professional perspective are just looking around themselves and saying I want to do something for the blokes in in, in my community um, and when we were talking about this, um, someone said something like, yeah, Australia's got an amazing history of creating grassroots guerrilla men's health movements. Um, and, and the argument for that starts potentially with the, um, with the men's sheds movement. You know? and, and, I, and I make this point, 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were you know, one, two, three, four, five, 10, 15 individual men's sheds around Australia, not coordinated. They kind of, they were popping up. Um, and there's a guy, um, Professor Barry Morgan, he did a talk at one of our, one of our events. He, he, he does this presentation, which he, he traces the growth of men's sheds like an epidemiologist. And he, and, and, and he, he demonstrates how it, it, it occurs, like you, if you saw it today, you would think he was doing a talk about coronavirus. But what he's mapping is the spread of men's sheds over 20 years, not just across Australia, um, but across the world, it's something that Australia has given to the world, the men's sheds movement. And there are now more men's sheds in Australia than there are McDonald's. And, 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 and if you sit in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne, that's hard to get your head around. But if you, you know, get outside of the city and travel around the country, every tiny community you go to has got a men's shed. But with so many different men's organisations in the country, is there a lot of crossover? Is there a lot of... Um, Obviously, there's a lot of passion and a, and, uh, and uh, a lot of enthusiasm to to help, but is there a, a way to coordinate these resources? Yeah, I mean, just to complete the previous point, what we're seeing at the moment with what I'm calling men's mental health organisations broadly, because it's mostly around mental health and social connection, is a grassroots explosion, which um, at the moment is looks like it will match the men's shed but because of its diversity i think could potentially um go beyond the men's shed movement in the next five or ten years um and so we've got organizations like man walk which 18 months ago was one group so one group of blokes meeting for a, a, a social connection walk around the gong uh, and and all of a sudden got got some national media coverage and it's gone viral and they're approaching a hundred groups. And that's one organization. I know men's sheds are a thousand organizations, but there are multiple mental health organizations that are, spring, that are springing up. Um, and yeah, they're not, they're not coordinated. They're not coordinated. And so the, 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 the thing is, is that in, 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 and this is true, not just of men's organizations, there may be some organisations, some areas of the country where, 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 where we're over-serviced, but there's certainly loads of areas where there are gaps. And to be honest with you, as most of these organisations are voluntary and, 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 and taxpayers' money isn't going into funding them, it's the more the merrier, right? Because no, what, 
as long as as long as there's one bloke turning up and getting support, then it then it has then it has value. So I mean, our role isn't to coordinate that, but I think part of our role is to is to can to have be a collective voice for that movement and to convince governments and funders and you were talking right at the very beginning Ian about you know your value proposition um it's to convince governments and funders this that, that this is this is a value to society and needs to be supported in what however that how, however we do that whether that's you know specific funding for organizations or or just uh, you know supporting kind embedding embedding this work in in in, in, in public service more uh, whatever um but yeah that that is not it's not yet been recognized by government as something that's happening so there's a lot of story about how you know blokes don't get blokes don't get help uh and how you know blokes are irresponsible around their their, their health and yet all these blokes are stepping forward and saying we want to we want more we want to do something we want to do something for ourselves you know all, all the 50 odd people on a on, on a zoom call late on a, on a on a Wednesday night, you know, here to have conversations about how to improve health, how to develop yourselves and all the rest of it. This is extraordinary. Um, but it, it's not unique in the sense that there are lots of other groups of men, communities of men around the country who are in this conversation. So uh, I think uh, uh, what a peak body does, when it does it well, is is does that, 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 that work of being the collective voice. And the, the Men's Health Connected um, online summit, which you, 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 you referenced, was a huge success because um, we created the platform, but basically because people are out there and hungry for this conversation. Uh, and it's really hard when you're doing the, you know, the voluntary work often of running an organization to put your head above the parapet and sort of do that work of, you know, coming together and creating a shared voice it's really important for an or for there to be some kind of organization in the center that can harness that and try and amplify our voices because we're stronger we're stronger together uh, and that ultimately happened with the men's sheds movement and that's when the men's sheds movement is now at a stage where you know it's a very well it's a very well funded movement and um, you know it's got amazing capital resources all these sheds all over the country but um whilst you know it's a lot a lot of volunteers still i think that's really important but it isn't just about a job. It's about actually people building community because they want to build community. But there's a recognition at, at government level um, that, that this is a value to society and needs to be funded. So, um, so yeah, one of my big, and I saw Ian dropped a question, um, you know, funding on men's health versus women's health. Well, you know, we, we talk about how men don't take care of their health. The more you dig into, and I don't, Men's health shouldn't be a men's health versus women's health conversation, right? Is women's health brilliant in some areas? Yeah, some areas not. Are there plenty of things that we could be doing to improve the lives and health of women and girls? Absolutely, there are. But one of the ways we measure, you know, how well we're doing for men and boys is how much time, money, and resources we put into improving the lives and health of men and boys. And, you know, whilst obviously Australia is doing better than so many countries around the world, we're very fortunate. And just look how fortunate we are to be here. Where else would you rather be during COVID-19? I mean, obviously, you'd choose Queensland over Sydney and Victoria if you had any common sense. But, you know, in terms of country, I mean, you know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be back in the UK or, you know, in, in the United States or anywhere in Europe right now. So we are a very blessed uh, and, and lucky country, and our, our, our well-being and it is is it far exceeds um, where Australia was, you know, 50 years ago. It far exceeds where most countries are. But boy, we could do better. And yeah. one of the ways we measure, you know, what we do is comparing what we do with with women and girls. Uh, and when you look at the, re, you know, we talk about men not taking their health seriously and and, and not focusing on their health, but the more you look at how little resource we put into men's health compared to women's health, um, the more you realize actually a big part of the problem is, is structural. And, and men have not been very good at coming together and advocating for themselves for all sorts of historic reasons we could talk about. But let me give you three quick examples and then I'll pause for breath to let you jump in or let some question. But three examples are just, just sort of like um, synthesized recently in terms of the way that we, um, we, we, fund, we fund men's health. Um, National Medical Research Council 
has um, put about uh, over a billion dollars of funding into men's health, women's health, and maternity health. That's taxpayers, it's our money. It's taxpayers' money. Over a billion of funding uh, into research in the last uh, seven years, and less than 20% of that has gone to men's health. There's one example. Um, you, we talk about men not going to the doctors, but there are fewer entry points to, to the health system for men. One way we see that is in national screening. Um, we, we screen all new mothers for mental health issues, but not all new dads, even though one in three parents with um, mental health issues are dads. Uh, in terms of cancer screening, 93% um, of the funding we spend on cancer screening goes to screening women for cancer. And then we say that blokes don't take care of their health. Well, we're not reaching out and helping them. The third and final example is we are very fortunate to be one of the few countries in the world to have a national men's health strategy. But when, um, I always care for what I say this because my job is paid for the Department of Health. So theoretically, Greg Hunt's my boss, right? But when Greg Hunt, this isn't recorded, is it, Ian? When Greg Hunt, um, <laughs> when Greg Hunt announced the uh, National Men's Health Strategy and the Women's Health Strategy last, um, last April, he also announced how much money was being allocated. And three times more money was being allocated to the women's strategy than the men's strategy. So over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, when you get inside the world of policy and funding, we are massively underfunding men when you compare, when you compare to women. And yet, when you, if you just look at it from an outcomes perspective, suicide, life expectancy, um, men are four times more likely to die of heart disease before the age of 65. There's a whole list of um, stats we could, we could reel off. Ah, oh, thanks for that. Uh, and and there, there are some of those stats. Um, yet we, we consistently invest less time, money and resources. And so, you know, whilst personal responsibility is a massive part of health and what mentoring men is all about is personal responsibility and stepping up. Um, I think we, um, I think it's really important. Uh, what I would really like to see as well as more men stepping up and forming these grassroots groups is, um, men as a group getting better at advocating for our needs, not in opposition to the needs of women and girls, but in addition to the needs of women and girls because there's a really strong case that we're not putting enough uh, time money and resources ah oh, resources because we're taxpayers um into supporting men's health and, and and suicide prevent male suicide is the classic one you know we keep chucking money at suicide prevention most of it goes to services that are better at reaching women than they are at reaching men so you know one of the things i'm starting to advocate for is a national male suicide prevention strategy with specific funding allocated to uh, male suicide prevention and for a recognition that this kind of grassroots work that you guys do is suicide prevention because when you provide social connection and support for men today you actually reduce the likelihood that they end up at a point of suicide a point of contemplating suicide in the future so it's not just about that pointy end clinical intervention for the guy who's going to kill himself tomorrow it's about that long-term community-based men supporting men prevention work which you guys do so well so um yeah and um there's also a question here uh, from judy uh, so is funding for women targeted to specific groups mothers business and violence against women uh, it misses a huge swathe of women Certain funding, yes, certain funding, no. But I really do stand by the point that I, I, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be getting into a men versus women argument. We, we should be looking at how can we do better for men and how can we do better for women. There's more we can do for women, definitely. Some of it's about the amount of money we spend, but some of it is how effective we actually, how effective we are at spending that money as well. It's not all about, it's not all about money. It's about what we, what we, what we do with it. So um, there's definitely more we can do for women and girls. I don't want anyone to leave this conversation yeah. thinking that I'm making the, any, any kind of case against that. And more often than not, um, so the two main, play, the two, two main areas that we focus funding on suicide prevention is mental health and previous attempts. So, because we know that people who've previously attempted are a high risk category. So it makes sense to, to sort of put focus on providing better aftercare. But the majority of the people who previously attempted are women and in 70% in of cases, men kill themselves at the first attempt. So whilst we're putting a hell of a lot of resources into suicide prevention, all of the money, pretty much without fail, with one or two exceptions of specific projects, 
but the vast majority of the money goes to services that are better at reaching women than they are at reaching men. And that leaves us with one option, which is to blame men for not using their, those services. However, if we actually specifically had, so two things that we need two things to happen. One is that we need to stop addressing suicide as purely a mental health issue and, and get other government departments involved. That is actually happening. That's really exciting. However, if we don't then add the gender piece and also focus on the differences between men and women showing up in those different spaces, we will miss the opportunity of a lifetime. So one of the things that I'm advocating for and will be over the next six to 18 months is that we become the first country in the world to have a national male suicide prevention plan. What's your view on what positive health looks like? So for, for, for me, if we focus on what gives health and what keeps us healthy rather than uh, you know, what causes ill health, um, then again, thank you, coronavirus. It's actually made us think about it probably more than ever before because we've had our, our normality ripped away from us and it's actually made us have to think about what's important to us in terms of keeping us well. And it's made us realize that things like having social connection, uh, you know, and all this stuff about, you know, make sure you have a little bit of exercise, make sure you have social connection, make sure, you, you know, all, all this kind of like messages about around how to stay well and healthy during lockdown are actually messages for life. Because what keeps us well is, it's different for different people, right? But what keeps us well is, 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 is relationship and connection with nature and exercise and things that make us happy and all, all, all these types of things. Um, but relationship with other human being is so fundamental to our, to, our, to our well-being, whether that's, you know, intimate relationship, family relationship, mates, whatever. Um, and then my favorite model uh, is, 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 is Martin Seligman's um, positive psychology model. And what, one, way, one of the ways that he describes his model is, is, in, is in three parts, which he says, and some of you may have heard this already, but so forgive me if I'm repeating what you already know. But he says uh, you can lead a, a good life, a pleasant life or a meaningful life. And they're all scientifically proven ways of actually living a living a good healthy happy life and a good life is simply doing more of what you're good at and a pleasant life is 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 focusing on doing stuff that pleases you and and a meaningful life is is doing what brings you brings you meaning and you know and i'm really i'm, I'm really blessed to to we were talking about the amount of hours that we put we put in doing work in this sector uh, ian and i in the break um, but I, I, you know, whilst I sometimes I overwork, which isn't good for my health. Part, the the reason for that is I don't consider myself to be working because I don't I don't get up and work. I get paid, I'm glad to say. Um, but thank you, thank you, Minister Hunt. Um, but I um, I don't um, I don't consider it as going to work. I, I I consider it as another opportunity to fulfil my purpose because my work is my purpose and it's it's meaningful to me, uh, and that provides me more health uh, more than anything else other than having a deeper meaningful long-term relationship with my with, with my partner and and the meaningful relationship with my family but particularly my daughter you know those are the things that keep me well um, and it's the meaning part that meaningful life which works for me now you can find that through through spirituality through you know having a having a having a having a, any kind of mission um, is, is down to you, but I, I would really, you know, make sure you put the, um, if I'm moving to sort of like giving advice, I'd say make sure you do get a balance of the stuff that you're good at and keep developing what you're good at uh, and the stuff that pleases you. But, but if you haven't found it yet, strive for the, strive for the things that have meaning because those are the things that will provide you with the healthiest uh, life of all. Relationship breakdown, relationship issues is the number one um, factor associated with suicide, setting aside being male, which is associated with 75%. So relationship issues, which includes conflict as well as breakdown, um, is uh, associated with over half of suicides. Uh, and of all the different ways of measuring that, um, relationship 
separation is the biggest single one. About 30% of all suicides are, uh, in, in men are, are, have recently experienced separation. And that goes from young men in their teens and early 20s right through to men in their 70s and 80s. At every age group, at least 10% of suicides are, are linked to separation. Um, and then there's the separation where children are involved, which has even more profound impacts. So fathers with dependent children separating has by far the most profound um, impact. We still are not doing this very well at all. This has been an, you know, an, an issue that goes back, uh, I mean, obviously, Couples have separated for centuries, right? And poems have, and plays have been written about it, but that kind of that, the, the modern phenomena of, 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 of family breakdown as a, as a large scale social problem, um, you know, goes right back to the early seventies. Um, there's still an organization in the UK called Families Need Fathers, which founded in like the early seventies. Um, over here we have Dads in Distress, which was formed in Coffs Harbor, just over 20 years ago, uh, bloke on his veranda thinking about whether he would kill himself on that veranda and thought there must be other blokes in this situation and instead he managed to get together a few blokes to have a yarn on a veranda uh, and in the process supported a peer support group which still runs today, um, Parents Beyond Breakup which runs Dads in Distress peer support groups and uh, a phone line separation impacts everyone right impacts men impacts women impacts children impacts families and society um but for all we live in an equal world where where our uh, you know most of the major barriers that separated men and women have been uh, removed uh, in terms of you know voting and work and uh, educational opportunities um and we do our best to bring up our sons and our daughters to have the best possible life and, and treat boys and girls equally nowhere are the differences between men and women more profoundly seen than in the world of parenting you know i mean it ain't rocket science it's not radical to point out that one of the parents has to carry the damn baby for nine months and then go through childbirth and and has a completely different embodied experience of parenting than the other parent and that's all to do with sex sex differences and you know despite the radical change we've had in the number of women who now balance work with childcare whilst men are far more involved in their children's lives than they ever have been, um, the dial has hardly shifted in terms of which parent is primarily responsible for, for finances um, when children are in their early, early years. So even not taking into account everything else, it shouldn't be any surprise to us that the, the, the process that men and women go through, mothers and fathers go through when they separate, is very, 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 very different. It's very different. Um, in many, in many cases, in, in the vast majority of cases, it's still dads who end up spending less time with their kids, um, and in some cases, no time. And mm. our compassion for fathers in that situation is nowhere near where it should be because that's heartbreaking and I you know and I speak from personal experience I was my daughter just 20 just turned 23 I was gonna say she's 22 she just turned 23 uh, and I was a full time at home dad in the first two or three years of her life and then had the misfortune to go through separation and the family courts um, and now I was always seen as the fortunate one because I managed to get shared custody in spite of not because of the court system but whilst I never wanted to deprive my daughter of the opportunity of having a, rela a relationship with her mum from my own selfish perspective I, I wanted her in my life every minute of every hour of every day 
And so people used to say to me, oh, you're lucky, aren't you? You know, they always used to ask me the question, oh, do you see, do you see, oh, you're separated. Do you see your daughter? Oh, you do see her? Well, you're lucky, aren't you? And I was living inside a conversation of my, my, my entire experience of family and father has been shattered, absolutely shattered. I live with the grief of my daughter not being around every single week. Every single week I live, live with the grief of, 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 of not having my daughter in my life for half of the week. And the, the other area is just bereavement. 10% of suicides, male suicides are linked to bereavement. Look at bereavement services and how well they do at engaging with men in bereavement. Men grieve completely differently to the way that women grieve. There are some overlaps, but there are some really gendered ways in which men grieve and which women grieve. And we're missing that completely. And that's something we all need to deal with at some time in our life, either personally or with, with, with friends. So my, fi my final thought on this, there are two policy things you can do that would radically change this. One is incredibly conserv uh, progressive and one is incredibly conservative. The pro progressive one is to introduce Scandinavian style shared parenting legislation where we actually support dads to be at home and give them the same support we give mums to be at home. And that will have benefits for both dads and mums. Equal, equal parental leave rights from, 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 from day, day dot. But the second one is strengthening the family and strengthening marriage, because actually the best way to avoid the pain and heartache of separation is to prevent people separating in the first place. So, you know, a absolute much greater focus. It's a very conservative and traditional thing to say, but I'm saying it as a progressive person, that we can balance those two things. The value of marriage and commitment and long-term relationship, but best possible support when people do split up. Plus the very progressive, more left-leaning approach of totally supporting mums and dads and sharing, bringing up their kids. Because what the evidence shows is that when couples do separate, if they shared care at the start, they're more likely to share care afterwards. Youth mental health program in schools. And there's a lot of work going on in that space. I just think what's in, um, and uh, especially through suicide prevention. Uh, and there's a, you know, a decent amount of evidence that uh, it works. There's something called uh, YAM, I think the Youth Awareness Mental Pro I can't, there is a program there's a few programs there's one that's particularly supported by um, by government um, the one point I will make is that uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that those sort of general programs are often um, uh, better at getting results with girls and boys so again just like with the other suicide stuff and, and health stuff we need to actually measure from the outset how effective these are with men and how they are with boys. And there's a lot of great members of AMHF who are organizations working with boys in schools. And I think programs, we shouldn't be afraid of doing, you know, separate, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a massive advocate for, 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 for same sex schools, but um, I think they should be allowed. Um, but certainly uh, same sex interventions in schools, interventions that focus on boys, interventions that focus on girls, so I, I think that getting stuff into, it's one of the key recommendations in the Productivity Commission's report on mental health. So that getting more mental health work into schools is definitely gonna happen. But what I think we need to do is advocate to make sure that, it's, that, that there's a specific focus on doing it for boys and addressing what boys' needs are. Uh, you can lead a, a good life, a pleasant life or a meaningful life and they're all scientifically proven ways of actually living a living a good healthy happy life <laughs> <laughs>